This podcast is brought to you by Progressive. Are you driving your car or doing laundry right now? Podcasts go best when they're bundled with another activity, like Progressive home and auto policies. They're best when bundled too. Having these two policies together makes insurance easier and could help you save. Customers who save by switching their home and car insurance to Progressive save nearly $800 on average. Quote a home and car bundle today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $793 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. This episode is brought to you by Choiceology, an original podcast from Charles Schwab. Choiceology is a show about the psychology and economics behind the decisions we make every day and how to make better ones. I'm Dr. Katie Milkman. Join me as I share true stories from Nobel laureates, athletes, authors, and everyday people faced with monumental decisions. We'll share useful tools and strategies to help you make better decisions in your own life. You can find Choiceology at schwab.com slash podcast or wherever you listen. Hey, how-to listeners. We're off again this week, so we're bringing you the second in our two-part series on humor in the workplace. This week, you'll learn how to crack jokes without offending your coworkers. I'm going to pass the mic to former host Amanda Ripley, and we'll see you back here next week. I don't know if it's just that I like to make jokes about cancer or what, but, oh my God. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I, the number of stories I have about inadvertently alienating people would take that's a whole podcast that we're going to do a spin-off series <laughs> called, <laughs> called called Michael stepped in it comma again Welcome to How to. I'm Amanda Ripley. You can't talk about humor without talking about jokes that bombed. So I want to start today by sharing a personal story that still makes me cringe. It was years ago when I was working at Time Magazine, and I was briefly and inexplicably put in charge of the Washington Bureau, which meant that I was managing people. All of a sudden, I went from being a reporter to a manager. And oh my God, it was terrible. What I learned is that managing people means listening to them come in your office and complain all day. (laughs) That's how I saw it. So at the end of my tenure, we had a little happy hour, and I realized way too late that I should probably give a toast. So I decided to try to make it funny, and I was not prepared, which was my first mistake. So I stood up in front of my colleagues, most of whom were older than I was, and I said, So what I've learned here is that managing you guys is like managing a bunch of five-year-olds. Cue the crickets. (laughs) I realized I had badly misread the room. I said what I had thought would be funny to me, but making fun of the people you're managing is not cool. So today we're resuming our conversation with two much funnier people. Naomi Bagdonis is the co-author of the delightful book, Humor Seriously, and Michael Terry is an amateur comedian who works in finance. They're gonna help us figure out how to prevent disasters like this one. For starters, you gotta recognize and match other people's sense of humor. Basically, sometimes you have to be a comedic chameleon. This is something I had to learn personally. I tend to be um, a little sillier. I can jump into characters more easily. I actually have a deeper improv training. Michael has deeper stand-up training. So it's sort of like the Montagues and Capulets on this call right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, when I was in my my mid-20s, I was designing and facilitating workshops for people who were, you know, predominantly 20 to 30 years my senior and, you know, predominantly more male than me. And I would often be, you know, the youngest person and the only woman in the room. And in that context, any degree of self-deprecation was not going to work for me. Naomi remembers in particular this one executive team workshop back in 2010. It's important to know that uh, the movie Inception was very hot at this time. Did you both see the movie Inception? There's one thing you should know about me. I specialize in a very specific type of security. Subconscious security. Oh yeah, we're talking about that epic Christopher Nolan movie with Leonardo DiCaprio that was more or less about mind control. The most senior person in the room was this guy named Craig. And Craig had been 
uh, sort of posturing all session. He was skeptical. He seemed a bit disengaged. He had, you know, the the alpha stance of his hands behind his head, chair leaned back, uh, and was just sort of like there, high status signaling. And so in the middle of explaining how to tailor your communication to different personality styles, Craig cuts me off. And he says, Naomi, can you just cut to the part where you tell me how to make my team do exactly what I want? And the air left the room. Everyone stiffened. And it sort of was this really tense and awkward moment. And so without thinking at all, I shot back. uh, That's a great question, Craig. You're actually thinking about the workshop that I run uh, on Inception. And that one's next week. You're, You're totally welcome to join. Come on back. Now, First of all, this is a wildly lame joke, but in that moment, the room erupted in laughter. Like, you know, everyone (laughs) laughed and all eyes turned back to Craig and Craig was smiling for the first time all day. And he said, word for word, I kid you not, I respect you. You can continue. (laughs) I said, thank you. I was planning on it. It, But it it shifted the energy in the room. And and for the rest of of the session, Craig was more engaged, everyone else followed suit, and it was this really sort of biting style humor that um, that kind of called him out on, on what he was doing. Um, and so that was the right. style of humor that I had to use when I was more junior. Craig sounds like a real asshole. Yeah. He, he was super. But there's I a mean, thread there, right? Which is there are people in the workplace who act that way. And, um, man, have I been in plenty of rooms where those people don't get called out and we can talk about the other side for a second, which is I've seen people try and be funny at work and I've seen people take a joke and try it in different rooms and they're just sort of going to bulldoze it. Like I'm going to do this joke no matter what the Mm -hmm. situation and who's there. Yes. And that doesn't work out great either. At some point, everyone will read the room wrong or make a joke that just crashes and burns. But most of us aren't stand-up comedians, right? We don't get to walk off stage and never see these people again. These are our colleagues. We're gonna have to see them in the morning. So what then? Stay with us. This episode is brought to you by Choiceology, an original podcast from Charles Schwab. I'm Dr. Katie Milkman, a behavioral scientist and professor at the Wharton School and the author of the best-selling book, How to Change. You may have heard expressions like, time to get up and going, today's bad decisions aren't going to make themselves, or bad decisions make good stories. But really, no one wants to suffer the consequences of making a bad choice. Join me as I share true stories from sports heroes, Nobel laureates, and everyday people faced with monumental decisions. We'll discuss the latest research in behavioral science and dive into themes like whether we can learn to make smarter decisions and how powerful it can be to get a do-over. And we'll share useful tools and strategies to help you make better choices in your own life. You can find Choiceology at schwab.com podcast or wherever you listen. You know that's the sound of another sale on your online Shopify store. But did you know Shopify powers selling in person too? That's right. Shopify is the sound of selling everywhere, online, in store, on social media, and beyond. One thing I've always dreamed about is being able to sell my art online. And Shopify has simple tools to help me set up and start selling my creations. Shopify POS is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. With Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash how to. That's all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash how to to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash how to. 
In 2013, after spending years at places like Goldman Sachs and Bank of America, Michael started a new job at Bridgewater, the world's largest hedge fund. This is a really intense place. Employees grade each other on 75 different attributes multiple times a week, and all the meetings are recorded and made available for critique so employees can learn from their mistakes. It's extremely competitive, and some have likened it to a cult. I was brought into a meeting with one of the CIOs, chief investment officers, a guy named Greg Jensen. Now, I didn't know Greg, and I didn't know most of the people in this room. This is my first week at work. As you can imagine, I'm trying to make a good impression. And this was just one of their weekly meetings. And unprompted, the guy who hired me turns to me and says, and we brought on Michael Terry. Michael, would you mind saying a few words about yourself? And I was not ready. I give some pretty plain vanilla self-introduction, but I decided to just on the spur of the moment, close it out with, I'm excited to be here and I'm ready to be programmed. (laughs) And you could have heard a pin drop. Mm. I look at Greg, Greg is looking at me blinking. I look around the room and everybody's like, oh God. And then I'm like, oh God, what have I done? What did you do? Did you say anything or just keep rolling? Um, No. Well, I mean, the thing that I found out afterwards was that a bunch of people thought it was funny, but they were sort of in shock that I had said it in front of the CIO. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. it didn't bomb as badly as I thought, but it bombed with one of the most important people at the firm. (laughs) And so it took me some time and effort to to build my relationship with Greg. Mm, So you're saying you kind of have to know the room before you can read the room, right? So does that mean you would never want to make a joke in a room with people you don't know, like in a job interview or a first date? It depends on the stakes, right? Like if I walk into drinks with friends and there's some friend I don't know, am I willing to make a random joke not knowing the room very well? Absolutely. My my first day at work at my new career, should I have, (laughs) should I have danced on what was potentially a nerve for some of the most senior people at that firm, maybe that wasn't a good trade-off. Right, right. Because you're not, you're, right. not, you're making fun of the firm culture, right? Not not of you. It's not self-deprecating. Yeah, right? that's 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 right. And, and what I have found over time is if you make jokes about the firm, that's, I've had leaders perceive that as criticism, as lack of confidence mm-hmm. in them, or even not being on board with the firm and its mission when the when none of those things were my intent. Michael, this example is a is a really great one of checking your distance. So, we talk a lot with our students about how close are you personally to the thing you're making light of? And in-group versus out-group humor. How do you how do you sort of know what you have license to to make light of? And so, imagine if someone else in the room had said to you, Michael, Michael, welcome and hope you're ready to be programmed. Right. That's a very different feeling than Michael, you saying, I'm ready to be programmed because that other person is part of the culture. They can sort of make fun of themselves in that way. But you, Michael, as sort of coming in, it's you don't have as much leeway to make light of the thing that you're not an in group member of. And so that's this principle of checking your distance. So here's our first insight. When you're trying to read a room, one thing to ask yourself is if you've earned the right to make a joke about a certain thing. Sort of like someone making fun of your mother. It's okay for you to do it, but anyone else? Mm, Not so much. The other thing that we talk about a lot is if you're thinking of saying something funny, don't ask, will this make me sound funny? Instead, ask, how will this make other people feel? The, the goal is not to get a laugh. It's mm. to make everyone in the room feel lighter and more at ease. And so if you ask yourself your, that question, it can mitigate a lot of sort of the nervous humor that comes out when you're trying to be funny, but it's not necessarily a good read of the room. Yes. And my terrible, terrible joke, I made <laughs> everyone in that room, I could hear everyone's butt clenched. That was the only (laughs) sound I could hear were butts around the room clenching. (laughs) If you take away one rule from both of these episodes, I hope it's this. Instead of asking yourself, will this make me sound funny? Ask yourself, how will this make other people feel? 
It's such a wise but simple reframing that could save you from yourself and hopefully from the sound of a thousand butts clenching. When you were telling the story, you said you weren't prepared to say something about yourself. It took you by surprise, which makes me wonder, do you actually prepare jokes in advance for interviews or other situations that are higher stakes? Sometimes, yes. But, you know, 98% of being funny at work just happened in the, or trying to be funny at work happened in the day to day, just being in the moment. And you're you're open to levity. Yeah, exactly. I was, I was in the moment. And if I started to feel a certain way, I would look around the room and see if I thought other people were feeling the same way. Yeah. Um, So it's a little more like improv, Naomi, right? Yeah. Look at you, Michael. You're an improv comedian. (laughs) Oh, don't boy. tell don't tell your friends and stand up. <laughs> no, and I but this is a really important distinction, I, I think, Amanda, and a really good um pinpointing of when these humor fails can happen for people. Because there's a difference in the type of humor that we use when we feel unprepared and out of control versus when we feel confident and in control. And so we hmm. often find when you get put on the spot when you're feeling nervous, that's when sort of Uh, caution goes to the wind and you can use humor as sort of a knee-jerk reaction that maybe isn't exactly how you want it to land. When you feel confident and prepared and in control, that's often when organic humor comes out that that is a bit more um, attuned. There's this quote I love that comedy is, comedy exists in the space between the comedian and the audience. There is no, there is no comedy that is funny by itself. It's all the relationship between the comedian and audience. And once you internalize that, you recognize, oh, got it. This isn't about me knowing the funny thing to say. It's about me being in the mindset and then being attuned to what's happening in the room around me. Hmm. Nobody has a 100% hit rate. I don't care who you are. But one of the ways to salvage that situation, if you're worried about it, is by acknowledging that it didn't work. Comedians do it all the time. It's called a save. When you tell a bad joke and then you joke about how bad it was. Yes. You let the tension out of that room. And it goes back to what we were saying before. You don't have to be hilarious. You don't have to have a great talent for joke writing. If you're just authentic. Totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just naming it is so powerful. I was um, I was watching comedy the other day live. Oh. And the comedian was on stage. He said this joke. Um, it it had to do with his car, and it just bombed. And he looks around the room. He goes to his notebook, and he just crosses it out and goes, "Car joke, never again." And everyone just <laughs> erupts laughing. And so it's totally that right. It's it's saying what's true. And again, that's why this is the most important thing people have to get into their heads. This isn't about being funny. It's not about saying the most clever thing. It's about being human and saying what is true. So there's our next insight. You want to signal that you have a pulse and you can feel when things don't go over well. Just acknowledge the elephant in the room. And if you really stepped in it, you can always sincerely apologize. Coming up, we're going to give you a few easy ways to inject humor into an otherwise boring workday, starting in the most unlikeliest of places, your email sign off. No kidding. We'll be right back. We've all been there. You have a question about your credit card. You call the number for help and can't get a hold of anyone. If only you had a Discover card. With 24-7 US-based live customer service from Discover, everyone has the option to talk to a real person anytime, day or night. Yep, you heard that right. A real person. Get the customer service you deserve with Discover. Limitations apply. See terms at discover.com slash credit card. Apple Card is the perfect cashback rewards credit card. You earn up to 3% daily cash on every purchase every day. That's 3% on your favorite products at Apple, 2% on all other Apple Card with Apple Pay purchases, and 1% on anything you buy with your titanium Apple Card or virtual card number. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, Salt Lake City Branch. Subject to credit approval. Terms apply. 
This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now, getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $750 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. We're back with Naomi Bagdonis, co-author of Humor Seriously, and Michael Terry, the funniest hedge fund guy I've ever met. Also the only hedge fund guy I've ever met. In Naomi's Stanford class, she and her co-author, Dr. Jennifer Ocker, have their students do a humor audit. Essentially, you take the last five emails you sent and look to see just how robotic, how cold and impersonal they are. You know, especially with how much we're communicating electronically, it's easier to leave our humanity on the table. And in fact, there was this great study that asked people, what traits inspire trust in a leader? And one of the top responses was speaks like a regular person. Which is where the email sign off comes in. So, Michael and Amanda, what word or words come before your name in your email? Oh, it's so bad. It's like, all best wishes. Yep. Okay, great. (laughs) Michael, what do you got? I'm embarrassed to say now that you said it, because it's all just standard. It's all just standard fare. It's like best regards and all that other faceless, useless (laughs) Yes. Niceties. Best. Best. Yes. Best. What is is best even mean? Are are you the best? Am I the best? Why do we need to? Sometimes if I really well, like you, I'll be like, take care. Right. <laughs> oh, well. What do you do, Naomi? Uh, it's always different. It's um, it's totally always different. Um, So let's see here. And by the way, while I'm digging up, I'm literally going to do this. I'm going to go into my scent inbox. Is it, are you honest? Or are you like, my tummy hurts, comma, Naomi? <laughs> my tummy hurts. <laughs> oh my God, I love that. <laughs> Okay, so this it's the easiest thing, and all you do is include a callback to something that you've said earlier in the email. So I'm looking, I literally pulled up my last five emails. Um, one of them, I talked about helping someone create buzz for her book, and I signed off with buzzing Naomi. Nice um, one. And nice. then another one, a friend of mine just, uh, or actually my editor recently switched to Little Brown, and I signed off with Little Brown better realize how lucky they are, Naomi. Um, <laughs> another email, I signed off with promotion sucks, Naomi. <laughs> I've been living in the, the world of bland best regards, and you just made me realize I've been living wrong for a long time. <laughs> and it's sad, but by showing some humanity in these emails, you stand out. Totally. Like, might as well, right? Since we have to send and read all these goddamn emails, we might as well, you know, it's like, it's like eating a bagel with nothing on it. Might as well put some cream cheese on it. Like, might as well make it pleasant. So our email sign off is the schmear on the bagel that is your email. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you for bringing that metaphor home. (laughs) That's how I'm going to think of it going forward. It's totally the schmear. So to bring this back to how do you do this in a really easy way. So one, make callbacks. If you shared a moment with that person, and this gets to the research around when we have, when we reminisce about moments of shared laughter, we feel closer. If you can make a callback to anything from a shared experience, do that. So Michael, if I could sign off uh, with um, ready to be programmed, Naomi, or, um, you know, Schmearing, schmearing the email, Naomi, right? There's something something that you said that I found funny, that's going to be the most powerful thing you can sign off with because it shows I see you, I appreciate you, mm-hmm. I love your humor. Now we're in an in-group together. 
Um, mm-hmm. the, the next best thing, if if you can't think of that, is to make a callback to what you already said in the email. Callbacks are such a powerful way of just having a bit of levity. If you can't do that, then just anything lighthearted. You could say, on my third cup of coffee for the day, or again, just anything that's a bit out of the ordinary. Once you get in the habit of it, it shouldn't take you more than five extra seconds per email. Well, and I like that you point out levity. Like we've been talking a lot about being honest, but like I should, I should not sign off my emails like staring into the abyss, comma Michael. <laughs> Wonder- right, there is a place for right. Like sometimes that's my mistake. Sometimes I'm a little too honest. Yeah. I think. Well, so that that's okay. I mean, that's okay too if, if that's true for you. Again, another in my list of a couple emails that I dug back on, someone had said, uh, this is a guy who runs a a company and he's got a big product launch this week. And he said, you know, so I feel like I'm flying into the chaos. And I I signed off with sending you energy as you fly into the chaos, right? Like that, that's Mm -hmm. powerful too. It doesn't have to be all light all the time. It can, it can really be what's true for you, um, including abyss related references. Excellent. Naomi's right. There's something to be said about not modifying your authentic humor style too much or forcing others to. The baseball player Alex Rodriguez once told Naomi this story about how this came up on his old team, the New York Yankees. It happened when another player, Johnny Damon, joined the notoriously stodgy franchise. They had famously strict policies about things like your hair, nothing long in the back, no facial hair. You know, actually, Michael, you'll like this. Alex says we were the Goldman Sachs of baseball. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> and um, and he, talks about, he talks about Johnny Damon joining the team in 2006. And there was a lot of buzz around this. He really didn't fit with the Yankees' ethos, right? He reveled in attention, uh, drove a black Ferrari. His autobiography was titled Idiot. And Alex said that the first day of spring training, Johnny Damon walks into the clubhouse at six in the morning with a boombox on his shoulder playing Kid Rock. And so it was this moment of totally not fitting in to the culture. But instead of shutting that down, they the team sort of embraced it and they said, okay, let's let's see where this goes. And what what Alex found was it unlocked a lot of other people's senses of humor too. That act of being out there, being weird, being himself actually relaxed people and made them play better and improve their performance. And it wasn't long before other players were were sort of getting in on the fun. So AJ Burnett, the pitcher, started a new tradition where uh, every time a teammate hit a home run, he would be waiting to smash them in the face with a pie. And here comes the pie from A.J. Burnett, the third walk-off by the Yankees, and this time Nick Swisher gets it in the mud, and he loves it. Uh, And so there, there was sort of this snowballing of humor, and it's this recognition that there are people who shift the the dynamic and the energy. So you're saying sometimes the secret to using humor, especially for leaders, is to just not get in the way. Just let it happen and and see what, what else happens after that. So is that right? Absolutely. Just don't kill the fun. <laughs> just right. go to the way. And Ed, Ed Catmull talks about this at Pixar, too. So former president of Pixar, uh, he talks about how fun is not a top-down thing. As CEO or as, as president, you can't say, okay, everyone, fun is really important here. Start having some. Uh, but but there are what Ed Catmull calls these instigators, these people in your organization that naturally bring a little bit of weirdness, a little bit of fun, and let everyone else feel looser and relaxed to bring out their sense of humor too. And so Ed personally went up to some of the instigators, some of the you know younger employees who didn't quite fit the mold, and he said, hey, listen – I want you to be having more fun and I want you to cause some trouble. I don't care what it looks like and I don't need to know, but just know that that you have my permission to do that. And like fast forward three weeks, they're shooting off these huge water bottles in the parking lot and someone's windshield was broken. And But, you know, Ed's like, listen, that's, that's what we need. We need some rule breaking. We need some rebel rousing. Studies also show that priming people with humor makes them more creative and more relaxed. It actually lowers our cortisol levels and allows us to engage with our higher order thinking. And at a time of low trust and high anxiety, this matters more than ever. 
And in particular, it used to be that leaders needed to be revered, and now they really need to be understood. And we find that humor is a path towards authentic connection, understanding, and trust. And we and we also know from the research that leaders with a good sense of humor are seen as 27% more motivating. Their teams report being 15% more engaged. And Amanda, as you said, they're also twice as likely to solve a creativity challenge. They're more creative and relaxed. Everything you're saying makes sense. But at this particular moment in time, I don't know if I would go to a group of 25-year-old guys at Pixar and be like, go make some trouble. Like, I don't know where, where that ends. Like, mm-hmm. it feels like right now people are, uh, you know, very worried about offending someone at work. So could, could you each talk about how to navigate the gray areas of humor, especially now? Popcorn Michael. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, look, what you learn in comedy is that everyone has a line and everyone's line is different. But at work, in some ways, it's easier because the lines are brighter and clearer. Mm. So if you're making jokes about someone else's appearance or their gender or their ethnicity or their age or their weight or whatever it is, the odds are badly against you in a lot of ways. And that's a quick way to find yourself in an awkward meeting with human resources. So that goes back to the idea of don't punch down. And also don't, just don't be an asshole is basically what you're saying. Yeah, don't be Craig is what I'm saying. Don't be Craig. (laughs) That's the whole, if there's one thing you take away from this podcast, it's don't be Craig. Yeah. Well, as, as as a white man who has also worked in comedy, do you feel like you're extra cautious right now? I think more what it's really done is I've turned the jokes more on myself. Like I joke about being a member of the patriarchy and what a good run we've had. Um, (laughs) And how certain members of the patriarchy blew it for us, but it's probably time to give other people a shot. Like being aware, I mean, and Naomi has hit on this many times, is being aware of who you are and how other people perceive you and being aware of what room you're in and who you're talking to matters a lot. And if I could... Can I zoom out for just a moment, too, of... um, Please. So one thing that Jennifer Ocker and I really believe, my my, um, co-author and partner in crime at Stanford, really believe through our research is that humor is also a window into having a more meaningful life. And there's research by hospice workers that reveals um, what do people wish for in their last days of life or what are some of their biggest regrets that they have at the end of life. And these regrets give a real window into how we create meaning in our lives. So I just wanna, I wanna mention, you know, this is not just about being more successful at work, it is. It is about being more successful at work and more creative and more resilient and and uh, mm-hmm. and getting promoted and getting jobs. But more more than that, we really believe that this is about leading a life of meaning, cultivating meaning in our lives and helping our teams and organizations cultivate meaning as well. Less death bummers. Less death bummers and live with fewer or maybe even no regrets. Thanks again to Michael Terry, who really is funny, even though he works at a hedge fund. And Naomi Bagdonis, look for her book, Humor Seriously. And we still really want to hear the jokes that never fail to make you laugh, or the ones that totally fell flat. We got a good one last week from Alex from Ontario, who told us about this funny moment with his family at a fancy restaurant. My uh, my now grandparents are having this pretty endearing moment, and uh, my grandpa, he says something along the lines of, uh, oh, I'm sometimes I can be such an idiot around the house. And my grandma says, oh no, no, never. I would never think of you as an idiot. And uh, my dad turns to them and says like, oh yeah, your daughter, she never calls me an idiot. She calls me a fucking idiot. And honestly, I've never laughed so hard at a dinner table at a fancy restaurant. And I still think about that moment. Thank you, Alex, and to everyone who reached out to us with your stories. As always, you can email us at howto at slate.com or call us at 646-495-4001. And we'll see about sharing your stories on the show to spread a little more laughter. And if you're looking for even more joy, search our back catalog for one of our earliest episodes called How to Be Funny. 
It features comedian Gary Goleman giving advice to an Oklahoma pastor about how to spice up his Sunday sermons. It's funny stuff. If you rely on how-to, the best way to support the show is by joining Slate Plus, Slate's membership program. Signing up for Slate Plus helps us help all the people you hear on our podcast every week. It's only $1 for the first month, and members will never hear another ad on our podcast or any other Slate podcast. You'll also get free and total access to Slate's website. Plus, you'll be supporting our important work. So I hope you'll join if you can. Again, it's just $1 for your first month. To sign up now, go to slate.com slash howto plus. Again, that's slate.com slash howto plus. Thanks. Howto's executive producer is Derek John. Rosemary Belson produces the show. Our theme music is by Hannes Brown, remixed by Merritt Jacob, our technical director. Special thanks to Amber Smith. Charles Duhigg created the show. I'm Amanda Ripley, flying into the chaos. See you next week. <laughs>